some days you just know are going to be good ones. We are beginning the JM third anniversary celebrations in style. I am stood on the hallowed ground of Goodwood Motor Circuit and I have behind me two beautiful Lotus cars because what else am I going to use to celebrate my third anniversary with? It's the mark that started the channel and so something I'm always going to support. And I've got to say a big thank you to my good and now old friends at Bell & Colville for sorting this day out for me. You see, I'm here today on one of their track days. And so I'm here not just to review the track day, but also to drive these two wonderful machines. And of course, I just couldn't possibly come down to a wonderful and historic race circuit with access to two brilliant driver's cars without making a bit of a video talking about them. And today I'm going to be answering a very specific question, which is, which one's the better buy? Because you might look at them and see the fact that they are actually, in the UK at least, very similarly priced. So what is the real differences? Let's take a look. Perhaps the most obvious is the fact that this is an Elise and this is an Exige. Specifically, this is an Elise 250 Cup and this is an Exige 350 Sport. This one is now the top of the Elise tree with the limited edition 260 Cup now having disappeared from the Lotus website and the 350 Sport is the bottom of the Exige tree. Now, once upon a time, these two cars were very closely related and to some extent they still are. But when you part them side by side, it's actually almost difficult to believe that they do share a lot of components between the two. Now, the Elise, of course, as you would expect, is slightly lighter, smaller, and down on power. And let's use the power of my beautiful new infographics to show you just how the two stack up. On paper, the Exige would seem to have it. The 200 kilo weight penalty is more than compensated for by the extra 100 horsepower and a more than 50% boost in torque. The car is slightly larger in all directions, the most noticeable visually being the extra width. The Exige is also another £12,000 over the Elise, however it takes only a small amount of discount or depreciation to match the two price-wise, and with Exige V6s being far more common than the Elise Cup, they are in reality near enough in price to make the comparison a valid one. Now interior trim really is a choice of spec rather than model differences. Both cars now come with the fantastic Lotus open gated shifter, beautiful thin rim steering wheel, and uh, pretty bare seats. Both of them have carbon fibre seats, which some of the lesser Elise do not. This car is trimmed in a slightly different material. And in fact, sorry, I made a mistake. These are actually fiberglass seats and the cup versions of these can get carbon or of course you can have carbon option. I like the interior of this with the blue stitching, the Alcantara. I'm not a big Alcantara fan, but it does suit this kind of car. And it's got some blue accents and things in it. So, but let's be honest here, you're not really going to buy either of these for their plush interiors. Not a big fan of the colour on this one, it is a fairly dull kind of pewter grey. Much more a fan of this, which apparently is definitely not BMW Estoril Blue, but looks suspiciously similar. However, in the sun, both cars do look pretty good, uh, this one in particular looking spectacular. It's from the back that you can perhaps most appreciate just how different the cars have become, with the Exige being just chunkier, bigger, wider and just all round more aggressive. I really like the big air intake on the side of the Exige and you'll note that this vent at the front here is in fact part functional, which I do like. Not so much of a fan of the revised front end on the cup, which you see has some of the vents here, but they've been enlarged, but they're not actually any usefully bigger. Whereas on this car, they are actually working. Or certainly this one does. I think this one is blanked off and is open on some of the other higher performing cars. This one's shod in stickier rubber than this one. This one having AO 52s and this one having regular Michelin Pilot Sports. But which is the better on track? Let's find out. Okay, so just about to head out onto track, my first ever time at the Goodwood Circuit, and in what a brilliant car. I do get very lucky when it comes to the opportunities that I'm given, and so I am again thankful to Ben and Colville for sorting out this day for me. 
Now it's going to take me a little bit of time to get warmed up and get used to the car. I'm going to have a, a few sessions in this car so I may not give you all the information you want right away. Uh, one thing I also want to mention is the fact that they have a different camera policy here, a camera rigging policy, to a lot of the other circuits that I go to. And basically there's absolutely no cameras allowed on the outside of cars at all. So I'm afraid some of the exciting dynamic exterior shots you may be used to from me I, I just can't do. But uh, I, the people here have been very nice very friendly and easy to deal with and very understanding of my situation so I've done the best that I can to get some, some cameras rigged up in here for you. Now officially this only has about six corners. Uh, there are actually more than that. One of them in fact is called No Name because it has no name. Um, but it looks like a good fun circuit. Uh, also interesting to note the Goodwood motor circuit is one of the very few circuits in the world which hasn't really changed its configuration since its inception. Even much younger circuits have now gone through several reprofilings to try and reduce speed, make things safer, or make it longer to accommodate bigger events or whatever. Um, this circuit has not. In fact, they stopped operation in 1966 because they refused to install chicanes to try and reduce the speed of some of the Grand Prix cars at the time, which were getting quicker and quicker and quicker. Morning. Morning. You've been down before, haven't you? No, you haven't? No. Nope. So, welcome to Goodwood. Thank you. Everyone here is exceedingly friendly. It's a really nice atmosphere on this day. I know the day is a little bit expensive, it's £425, which is more than your average track day, but the atmosphere is nice. It's a wonderful, amazing venue. If you've got a nicer car, you know, something that maybe you would traditionally take out on a normal track day, but you really would like to, I'm going to highly recommend this event. And it's not limited to a Bell and Colville customers or Lotus customers or anything else. You can see there's a Suzuki Swift in front of me, uh, there's I believe a Porsche behind me and of course a bunch of Lotus all around the place. So it's a real mixed bag. If your car meets the rules of the circuit you are welcome to come along and if you're interested in joining Bell & Colville for one of these days please give Maxine a call. All their details will be in the description below. So the circuit stopped racing in 1966 and didn't continue again until 1998 when the Goodwood Revival started and they've been doing classic racing, the odd track day and thing here ever since. And I'm kind of grateful, this is a real connection to the past, and coming here, honestly, it feels more like a, a horse racing venue than it does a racing circuit. It's got this wonderful whitewashed walls, and it feels like a real vintage place, and the thing is, it's great because it's not actually really put on, as it were. This is how it was, and I love it for that. It's, it's really cool, really special. Now, the Elise is a fairly snug car at the best of times for anybody. Uh, and honestly, in these cars, it's height, not weight, which is generally the enemy if you're concerned about fitting in them. Uh, with a helmet on, I am touching the ceiling. That's, that's it. I'm kind of pivoting around there. So um, this is something to be wary of. Now, if you're a particularly tall driver or you do a lot of track days and things, one thing people do is they will actually bolt the driver's seat to the floor. You see, the passenger seat is already bolted and fixed in. It doesn't adjust at all. So it is therefore just a little bit lower down further back. So you can do the same thing with the driver's seat. Of course, the problem is if more than one person drives your car, then you better hope that they are roughly the same height as you. Otherwise, they're not going to have a very good time. Uh, pedals also are fairly close together, and I have today put a little pedal cam in so you can see what I'm doing, and hopefully I'm not going to make too much of a hash of things. I've got the car in sport mode, which is going to loosen the reins just a little bit. I'm not going to turn traction fully off because I do not see the point, uh, and also if I you know, break this car, I may have to pay for it. Here I go, out on the historic Goodwood circuit. Oh, 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 this is special. Now this first corner is called Madgewick. After that, my memory gets a touch hazy, it must be said. Oh, cam is interesting. Now one of the corners I'm about to approach, they call something like the most dangerous corner in motorsport. So it's really, you know, fills you with confidence, it must be said. Oh, the Suzuki Swift must know where he's going because he's off flying away. And he's get his car warmed through, start learning the circuit. Oh, these cars steer so beautifully. Every time I get back into a load, I'm just like, yep, it is as good as I remember. And with these later releases, you get this uprated shifter as well. This place is basically a working aerodrome as well. So the circuit is essentially the perimeter road of an airfield, which is quite fun. All right, let's start moving now. Car revs to about 7,000 RPM. 
Now the last time I drove a Cup 250 was on the road where it's an excellent car, however the car that I drove was very far from standard, it's a heavily modified example. So if you want to see that video, kind of click up here or just go searching for it and that was a fantastic car, I mean really properly brilliant. And even with aftermarket suspension and so on, it actually rode beautifully. It was a lot of fun. Okay, I'll try and build the speed progressively here. These cars are just so intuitive. And if you're a track day novice, these are actually a brilliant car because the chassis is superb, the handling is sublime, and there's enough power in it. Uh, we got an Evora GT430 behind. in a lovely olive green colour. That's Trevor, I believe, in that car. And these supercharged cars, they've got a very different character to the older supercharged cars, which had the old 2ZZ lump in, and those red for days, and they would sound quite manic. Most of those that I've driven are also quite modified, and you just get this constant supercharger whine in them. Uh, this one, not so much. Oh yeah, oh this is a this is a tricky little corner because I'm trying to work out where do you brake and then where do you change down. My lines, by the way, are going to be absolutely horrendous, probably for the entire day. I may try and get some instruction later. But the problem is I can't have the cameras in the car and the instructors, and it takes a long, long time to rig the cameras in these cars, especially when I'm doing it the way that I am here. There's not much room inside these things, so rigging them basically I turn into a contortionist. I'm not really very good at doing that. This is certainly not an outright straight line speed car, as is evidenced by the fact that I'm not really pulling an awful lot on the Suzuki Swift Sport that's in front of me. But it's just such a delightful thing. And here's the thing, right, on track days, I'm just not bothered about lap times. I'm really not. There's always gonna be someone faster out there. There's always gonna be someone slower. And it's just about having fun. That's the key thing. about enjoying yourself and having a good time and that is where something like this Elise really shines it's just so intuitive and so mechanical and so interactive and also when you do get up to speed if you've got good tires on it you can do some pretty silly things with them the best thing to not bring on a track day of any description is pride but the really nice thing about a track day like this one in Val and Colville days is the fact that there's generally a common theme people are all proper petrol heads there's just not people being silly everyone's nice and friendly I was having a good chat with loads of people in the briefing this morning and they're all like-minded people they're all here just to have a nice day and it is a great day to bring whatever it is that you own on a track day especially if you are concerned about the way people are driving everyone out here is being very very good well behaved brakes in this thing are really progressive, very nice, very easy. It's one of the weaknesses of my old Series 2 111R, so the brake pedal had about an inch of dead travel and they eliminated that quite a few years ago and now the brakes are magnificent. Well, this is a real fun circuit and yeah, I can see what they mean, there's not really much runoff. If you get four tyres on the grass here, you're probably going to have a very bad day. i got to get down here for the revival sometime, that must be amazing. So all these braking areas which are actually still part of the corner this is the thing that's tricky and this is what I'm going to be working on later in the day to try and improve I'm going to try something here I've been changing out a second for this but with the supercharger I'm just not entirely sure it's necessary yeah I think actually I'm probably just making unnecessary effort for myself by changing down a second there. Third is all you need. Because this car doesn't rev quite as stratospherically high as the old Elise, you don't be wary when you are changing down that you don't over rev it. Now that corner I could have gone through much faster using a bit more of the circuit so I'm going to aim just corner by corner I'm going to start knocking the circuit down. It, it, that, that's what the circuit does, it, it flows, it really does flow. through. Now this one's tricky, this one actually is much tighter than it appears to be. And then you're already on full power, all the time Apex that one, down through here. Yeah, we go. 
go. Snatch fifth. Hard down here. Oh, this thing's planted. And then on the brakes, fourth, third, and turn in. And tight for this section. Oh, you can just feel the car just transferring the weight around. Oh, it's lovely. No drama. Wait, you better curb. Well, the 250 Cup, considering this is completely out of the box, is a lot of fun. If you want to go fast on a track day, there's better cars, and there's better cars for the money. Never going to try and pretend that's anything other than the case. But as an enjoyable thing to drive, oh, it's great. So I'm now in the Exige Sport 350. Officially speaking, you would think that this should be the slightly less hardcore car, with the Elise being a cup and this simply being a sport. The truth is that the moment you sit in this, it doesn't really feel that much different until you press the start button. This thing sounds louder, more raucous, the whole cabin just resonates, the gearbox grinds and chunters behind you like all the V6 gearboxes do, and it does feel like a slightly more grown-up car. Now I have actually just been out on track in this car as well with an instructor to help try and improve my line a little bit and I've tried to learn the track a little bit more but I'm still getting to grips with it. And I can tell you that this thing is very, very different. But of course you don't want to be told, you want to be shown. The car has buckets more torque than the little Elise, it really does. Even when you're not trying, you are going a hell of a lot quicker in this thing. This circuit flows and weaves and it's really quite wonderful. Now I've started getting together with it, it's just a little bit nicer. And it's quite amazing, <laughs> it's like a serene countryside road in some ways, but just fantastic. Now the whole car is just completely alive in a way that perhaps even the Elise isn't. But that does mean of course that you have to give it a huge amount more respect because this thing is capable of much higher speeds. Another thing you probably notice is the fact that the uh, rear visibility in this is uh, not quite so good. Now this corner apparently I was taking a pretty good line with you to stay out quite wide. This first corner, Madrig, it's taken some time to get it quite right, but it's very rewarding. Kind of go round, out, and then what you do is you kind of set the steering up and the camber actually steers for you so I'm not even changing what I'm doing and apparently the second apex there is the one you want to worry about the first one you don't actually want to hit you snatch fifth here and then I just dab the brakes a little bit but really I should just be lifting instead apexing there back out nice and wide coming along here get it all very fast down into fourth and I am leaving quite a bit of reserve now this one actually I've cocked that up there you're supposed to turn it a bit earlier than the board says I also say stay through fourth this corner you need to stay in fourth four and then this one drop down to third and this one turn late and hard in get on the power it's all about making as few adjustments as you possibly can but this thing just shoves you down the road so basically by this corner I'm already doing the same speed that I was at the end of the straight in the Elise carrying probably another 15 mile an hour in speed and leave myself plenty of room here staying kind of wide then using that turning board making it flow in turn 
and um, out and you build into a rhythm. Now you can of course feel that big tall V6 behind you. But as long as you're aware of it, again, it doesn't impede your fun. They're not as quick as you perhaps may expect, but you feel like you're going fast when you're in them. And to me, actually, that's really the more important sensation. Just dab on just to settle the front. Through, and yeah, I should have turned earlier on that one. Yeah, and got that wrong. Yeah, also got that one wrong, but hey-ho. I'm here to learn and have fun and I am doing both. It sounds like a much more intense hardcore car being in this thing, it really does. Again, same as the Exige, I'm in sport mode. Which is the better car? Well, if I were going to buy one, it'd be this. Here's my reasons why. The 250 is a stunning car, I mean properly, properly brilliant, wonderful thing and it's just so nice to drive and as a road guy is well mannered on a, on a tighter, twistier circuit somewhere like Cadwell Park for example, it's well at home and it's great fun. This is actually quite a fast flowing circuit and so this car can really stretch its legs in comparison to the 250. And the other thing as well is that with the 250 I feel like, now okay maybe this is a a touch of an exaggeration but I feel like I would get to its limit quicker than I would with this I feel like this is a car I feel like the 350 is a car that I can grow and a car that I can grow with you see one of the issues with the 250 is that basically Lotus really have taken that kind of as, as far as they can there's not an awful lot you can do to get more power out of that little 1.8 it's kind of at its limit whereas this V6 there's quite a few tuning options and things with it. There's a lot that you can do. And so as you improve as a driver, if you so desire, it will grow with you. However, if outright speed and all that jazz isn't your forte, there is still something to be said for the 350 because it has that much improved torque and it's just an easier car to pedal. It does also mean that it's a nicer car to drive when you're not going 10 tenths. And with the sheer number of these out there at pretty much bargain prices, I think this is the car that wins it for me. Uh, that being said, the Cup 250 is still an incredibly special thing, particularly if you can find one of those first generation cars with the extra air on them. They are really wicked little things. And for a road car, Depending on the roads that you like driving, perhaps they have the edge. Anyway, I want to say a huge thank you to Ben and Colville for making today possible. In particular to Maxine for being our host today and to Jamie, the sales guy there, for setting this up for me. If you want to buy a new Lotus, or indeed a used one, go and see him. He'll look after you, because he certainly looked after me. Thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.